podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here. Welcome to the show. First, I want to say something. Um, This is a show about health, specifically about gut health, the microbiome and all those things. And yes, we have covered it in the past, but this is different. I also want to say we're not turning into a health podcast. I kind of realized we've had a lot on, but I had planned on putting that topic aside for a while until I met our guest this week. I got to tell you, this is the longest I've ever spoke with a guest uh, straight through. I think we were on the phone for over two hours. Now, the episode obviously is about half of that because some of it is not meant for air and some of it just shouldn't be aired, but all of it is great. This week on the show, we have Dr. Will Bolsowitz. And the reason I'm so excited to have him on is because, well, he is no bull, so it's, okay? He, yeah, corny joke there, he has the trifecta of credentials, in my opinion. Okay, so what's the trifecta? Well, first, a glowing formal education background. He's a graduate of Georgetown University School of Medicine. He trained in internal medicine at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and gastroenterology at the University of North Carolina Hospitals. Oh, and he earned a Master's of Science in Clinical Investigation from Northwestern and a Certificate in Nutrition from Cornell. And he's also board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. Now, why is that so fantastic? Well, because not only are they amazing schools, I didn't know how great they were until he was telling me about the, the program ranks, but he, his background is in not just internal medicine, and not just the gut, therefore gastroenterology, but also in research, clinical investigation. So a lot of this episode is talking about the actual research. Like he reads these things and then deciphers them. And I even feel like, you know, some people I follow, some people I've listened to are really good at marketing, but don't have this kind of background. And that's why I really like Dr. B as he's referred to, by the way. We're not going to go through the whole name anymore. So the first part is this amazing education that covers both the specific in gastroenterology and the research piece. The second is he's been doing this for over 15 years. So he's seen so many cases and you can just hear his experience come off. And the third, the third is he's not selling anything. No books, no supplements no classes or workshops. Why is that important? Look, I've got nothing against selling things. In fact, I understand why it happens. Hear me out. If you're a doctor, you're spending a lot of your time with patients, as Dr. B is. You're in there doing surgeries, you're seeing patients, you're making charts, you're following up, all this. And you make really good money. If you have your own practice, as he does, if you want to make better money, you just see more patients. Okay, so there's that. Now, if you want to go the route of selling supplements and classes and workshops and all that, that's fine, but you're probably going to move to that mostly full time because of the sheer amount of effort it takes. Sure, you might have a little bit of a practice, but there's no way you can dedicate yourself to it. And then very clearly, your focus becomes selling more things. And to sell more things, you have to talk about more problems, talk about more things that you should buy. But Dr. B is a rare breed. He has his practice that keeps him going. I'm sure he makes good money and you can hear it in his voice. He just doesn't like all the false information that's being spread. So he thought with his background in research and what he does at his practice and his background in gastroenterology, he could be a thought leader in this blossoming space of the gut biome. But keep in mind, taking the time to read all of this research, to put it out there, to write articles, to come on podcasts with no return in mind, is a noble feat. Kind of feels like podcasting for eight years with no return. Anyways, now for me, all the things he said weren't an easy pill to swallow. 
In fact, Tim and I went back and forth on email after the interview, sending research articles and journal articles back and forth. He actually mentioned some of these journal articles in the episode, and if you want them, they're in the post at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Some of the things he says seem controversial to someone like myself who's very much in the health space. You know, he's like, ah, gluten, no problem. You can eat it. Grains are getting a bad rep. Most supplements are bunk, et cetera, et cetera. And then he backs it up with research. But you be the judge. We have them on. You get smarter and do with it what you please. So we are going to be talking to Dr. B about gut health, probiotics, testing, food sensitivities, the gut, diet, vegetables, gluten, and much more. We are at smartpeoplepodcast.com. This is an episode, by the way, I really want to know what you think. So go ahead and email us. We're at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Let's get into it. Cannot wait to bring you one of my favorite guests, and I'm sure now a friend for life, who, by the way, we will have back on. Here it is, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, a.k.a. Dr. B. Enjoy. Well, Dr. B, thanks so much for being on the show. Chris, I'm super psyched to be here with the Smart People Podcast. And, you know, I just, I think that we have so much interesting stuff to talk about. And I, I hope that it's something that your listeners are going to really enjoy and learn something from, honestly. Oh, they will. And even if they didn't know that they need to learn about it, I know they need to learn about it. So that's why you're on <laughs> right? So, yeah, thank you. So here's the thing, right? You're, you're a unique person in that you're a gut doctor. All right. You are, you are the gut health MD, but you're a real gut doctor. And what I mean by that is, you know, this idea of the gut biome, healthy gut is really blowing up right now. But I do think oftentimes it's, you know, your, your health coaches, your NDs, n nothing against them, but I don't really know if I've talked to somebody who is a gastroenterologist per se. So yeah. I'm excited to talk about that. Tell me how you got into this field. Well, um, when I made this decision, which was like 15 years ago, I mean, you know, I did, um, if you include college being pre-med, it was 16 years of education and training, um, rocking 80 hours a week. Like, you know, essentially I think about this sometimes that this was like 32 years of work, which is some people retire after working for 32 years. <laughs> and my career literally just started after working for 32 years. But anyway, about 15 years ago, I was at Georgetown for medical school and trying to make a decision uh, on what to do. And frankly, at that time, we knew almost nothing about the gut microbiome and the things that we're going to talk about tonight. But the but um, the thing that happened for me is I I really enjoyed a little bit of medicine, meaning internal medicine, using my mind to peel away the layers of a complex medical problem. And I also liked the idea of being able to use my hands to fix things. And, but, you know, the thing for me was when I went into the operating room during my medical training in med school, I, I didn't really love the fact that there's, there's complications. Like you just have to have thick enough skin to accept that you could be a great surgeon and you're still going to have some patients who don't come out with the results that everyone walked into the surgery with. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this was the perfect fit because I am trained as an internal medicine doctor. I'm board certified as an internal medicine doctor that allows me to really understand, you know, everything about not only gastroenterology, but I understand cardiology and, you know, nephrology and all these other fields. But then I have that, that focused specialized training that makes me an expert in this particular niche, the digestive system. And I get to do really cool procedures. Like people may think, why would you ever want to do a colonoscopy? Well, I mean, it's like playing a video game, first of all. And <laughs> second of all, I'm curing cancer. So, you know, I remove polyps. And when I remove the polyp, I walk out and I tell the patient, if you didn't come in for your colonoscopy, you could have had colon cancer in a few years. But instead, I took it out and we're good to go. Go on home and go grab a, you know, go grab like a beer and enjoy the rest of your day. So... Well, I, let me, let me go into that for a second. I hadn't thought about that, but you brought it up and now it's just stuck in my mind. 
at no point in your career did you go, oh, wait, I'm going to have to look at a lot of buttholes. Well, I mean, you have a valid point. And when you like, for example, when I was single before I met my wife, um, every single person that you go on a date with, they're kind of looking at you skeptically, like, you know, is this guy a total creeper? What's the deal with him? (laughs) And And then you meet their mom and they, too, are like pretty darn skeptical of you in the very beginning. Yeah. But the reality is that when you're in medical school, like every single field has gnarly elements, every single field. And, you know, you just see crazy, insane stuff when you're rotating through all of these different specialties. And you kind of, to some degree, become immune to like how gnarly medicine can be at times. You stop thinking about it. Yeah. And so like, I, I mean, I suppose you could say like when I do colonoscopy, like I'm looking at poop like all day long. Right. But it doesn't even, frankly, register with me anymore because I'm doing this so often that I'm just focused on doing my job and making sure I'm taking great care of my patients and things like that. So, you know, so it kind of all that stuff ends up falling to the wayside. And really what you want is you want something that you are passionate about and that brings you great satisfaction because the reality is in medicine in 2018, you are going to be working really hard. There's just no getting around that. So you have to really love what you do and you know, the people who do it for money or things like that are the ones who end up very uh, frustrated with choosing a career in healthcare. So, yeah. And I'm, I'm glad we, we actually touched on that because I've thought about this before. How, how do doctors get into those fields, right? Not the, the obvious ones, but the ones that are specifically dealing with grimy, gross, or at least to most people, those types of things. But again, to what you're saying, Eventually, it's just you look at it as part of this amazing human machine and no part is really that different from something else. Yeah. And, and, well, and for me, like, you know, there's less of a focus on the strange, you know, aspects of what I do for a living. Right. There's more of a focus on, gosh, this is like really cool. I, you know, for example, a cardiologist, they they just deal with the heart. Like it's one organ, it beats, you know, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think the physiology is interesting, but for me, I deal with the esophagus, the liver, the pancreas, the stomach, the small intestine, the colon, you know, you just keep going down the line and there's so many parts of the body that I'm the expert in and they're all a little bit different Mm -hmm. and have their own nuance or their own things about them that make them interesting or, you know, I mean, honestly, like, as a doctor, the more that you learn, at least for me, the more that I learn about the body and the way that it works, the more that I'm convinced of two things. Number one, I don't think we know hardly anything. Like I think that we know 1% of what's actually going on in the body. Wow. And you know, what we do in modern medicine is so simplistic if, if we could really understand everything. And the second thing is honestly, the way that we work as humans, it's something that if anything, it makes you like more, um, religious, Mm. it makes you believe in God because it's so perfect. Like it makes so much sense the way that the human body is designed to work. And, you know, you could, I guess you could chalk that up to evolution, but there's just, I don't know, there's just so much to it. That's incredible. And how could you, how could you ignore that, you know, the beauty of like just who we are as human beings. Here's the other thing I was thinking of. I was reading your bio and you've got all these awards and you've done all this. Did you know that you wanted to go into medicine from an early age? And were you always driven to work your 32 years in a condensed period? Because I always revere people who do school for that much simply based on work ethic and drive and stick to itiveness. I always had a an idealistic element to who I am. I always had that like as a kid and there was a compassionate part of me, you know, and that goes along with being idealistic. And so I really originally thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then I realized that I didn't like cats, (laughs) which is ironic because um, I subsequently, like during residency, I was too busy to get dogs. And so I had two cats, which I don't know what that, like, (laughs) go ahead and judge me. I don't know what to say. Wait, do you still dislike cats? No, I love cats. Oh, okay. Just checking. Okay. That's yeah. I ended up up getting two cats in residency because I couldn't get a dog, you know, so I was the cat guy. Yeah. But anyway, um, so that's what sort of made me walk away from being a veterinarian and 
become interested in medicine. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I was 16, I decided that this is what I wanted to do. Mm. And to me, it was like this huge, um, this huge undertaking to prove that I was capable of getting myself into medical school. And when that actually happens, that was such a satisfying thing for me. But I am, I, I'd come from a family where I watched how hard my parents worked. Um, my mom is, I don't know if like <laughs> I'm supposed to say this, yeah. but she's Irish. She's just a hard worker. She's yeah. like, she just grinds. And I watched that. And I think that that left an impression on me, not like consciously. It's not like, Hey, I'm going to be like my mom, yeah. but more just like seeing how hard your family works to provide. And so that left an impression that, you know, as I moved through my career, I, I can't help the fact that this is who I am, where I, I am a goal setting person. I always am lining up a goal and I'm always just kind of aggressively trying to figure out how I'm going to complete that goal. And it just, okay. that's what happens to me along this path. And that's what led to all of these sort of doors opening up in front of me and then a new goal starts. Yeah. And so, you know, so it was just very interesting and sort of my coming of age for me personally was where things like really, really changed was when I was 20, um, I was still 26 years old. I was one of the youngest guys in my med school class. And I, I, I had my MD and I completed my intern year and this is at Northwestern. And, you know, I mean, I just have to tell you like Northwestern internal medicine residency program, our program is one of the hardest to get into in the whole country. Mm -hmm. It is ridiculous. The people that end up getting in mm -hmm. 4,000 applications for 40 spots. Wow. And, and, you know, I really worked hard that intern year and I was picked like to my surprise as the intern of the year. And when that happens, like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? Yeah. I just got picked out of my class of these amazing people who I have such great respect for. And, um, from that day forward, I've just been, um, doing, you know, doing my best and seeing where it takes me. And here I am. Yeah. So you're a grinder with some intelligence. I mean, I always tell people uh, the number one, or maybe the number two thing I've learned in this podcast is that people that reach a, a level of prominence in their field, I'd say can predominantly chalk it up to hard work. I mean, really. And, and I, I respect that because I think at times I lack that at times, I guess we all do, but, and I think you're a testament to that. When you made the move to gastroenterology, why did you do it? And the reason we've touched on it a little bit, here's the reason. In my opinion, go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong, but like the 90s, we were all about kind of the heart and, you know, really trying to figure that out, heart attacks and all that. Then 2000-ish, it was all about the brain, right? It's like, oh, everybody's into this neurotransmitters and there's depression going on. We're trying to fix that. Everybody knows serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, all that. And then after that, 2010 to today, it's all about the gut. So it's almost like you struck the, the Dr. Gold in going into the field that's going to get the most play. I don't know. That's just me. What do you think about that? Well, I like, I like the theory and the timeline that you laid out. That was kind of a, <laughs> kind of a cool narrative. Um, but the, the truth is that by the time I had made the decision to go into gastroenterology, which was, I was in my third year of med school and this was 2005. Yeah. Um, when I made that decision, it was already, this was already one of the hardest fields to get into. This was not low hanging fruit and this was not being ahead of the curve. Um, this is, this is tremendously difficult the vast majority of people who try to get into GI do not get into GI, the vast majority of people. And the reason why, if you go back and you look at what it, what it is, is that cardiology was always, always sort of the, um, Mecca of the internal medicine subspecialties mm -hmm. but that really changed in the nineties when, our, when our government um, authorized us to start doing screening colonoscopy at age 50 mm. and made it so that now gastroenterology is this procedurally oriented field. You spend 50% of your time doing procedures um, and you're still an internist. And it, I mean, let me just be honest. If you look at what are the hardest fields to get into, it's a combination of two things. I would say, number one, follow the money. Dermatology. I mean, I'm just being honest. 
I'm just being honest. Yeah, follow the money. So who gets paid the most? The, the, the guys who get paid the most are the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, the spine surgeons. And those are incredibly difficult fields to get into. And people are, you know, doing everything they can to get into that. And then the, the second thing is lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And um, people these days, uh, you know, maybe it's a millennial thing, but people these days want a good lifestyle. They don't want to work 90 hours a week like, a, like some surgeons do. So gastroenterology, you take that and you can put, compare it to cardiology. And I, I hope to not insult any cardiologists who are listening to this right now. I have tons of friends who are cardiologists. I love the field. But in general, we make more money and we work less. Sure. And so if you look at it from that regard, that's kind of what happened in the 90s that changed. And it made our field extremely popular. Now, we didn't know that it would become sort of the sexy field in terms of, hey, like the, the paradigm is literally shifting for everyone and it's focused in our field. We didn't, no one knew that. That didn't happen until about 2006. Is it fair to say that the gut, right? The microbiome, essentially the, the core of, well, part of what you do is the most, um, I don't know, the most talked about part of medicine at the moment. It seems like it to me. It, it, it is. I mean, I think clearly this is the most talked about part of medicine, but here's the challenge the information is coming so fast, like 30 new studies on a daily basis are coming out. Mm -hmm. And this, this to me is like, you know, you think about when, for example, when they discovered bacteria or when they discovered penicillin, like these were game changing moments in our understanding of health and disease. Mm -hmm. You know, when they discovered uh, bacteria, you know, Louis Pasteur did these studies in France in the 1850s and 1860s. Prior to that, their understanding of disease was they thought the disease was caused by something like the, the Black Plague. They thought it was caused by something called miasma, which is like a borderline supernatural weird thing where you walk past a swamp and there's a mist in the swamp and it smells funny. That's what they thought was like causing the black plague. They had no understanding that it could be a bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so when Louis Pasteur discovered that it completely changed the game, it completely changed the game. And I kind of feel like that's what we're living through right now with these discoveries with the microbiome is that the game is changing. Like, Day by day, we are learning new things that sh- that affect our understanding of human health. But the problem is that none of the doctors have been trained in this. This is all brand new. Right. The amount of information is so overwhelming. How do we train the current generation of doctors? How do we do it? And that's part of what you know everyone needs to try to figure out within the healthcare community is how do we how do we use this knowledge and apply it within our clinic? That's one of the things that I'm trying to do. What was the tipping point and what was the thinking prior to and post? Well, the, t- the tipping point actually has to do with a um, advance in our laboratory techniques. And so what you have to understand is, so first of all, let me define what the microbiome is for the listeners at home. We're talking about the community of microorganisms that live in and on the body. So when we talk about the gut microbiome, we're talking about the community that lives inside of your gut. And this is a combination of essentially five different types of organisms, bacteria, yeast, parasites, something really weird called archaea, which are single cellular organisms, just like bacteria. They're not exactly the same. Um, They have been around on our planet for 4 billion years. They predate oxygen on our planet. And you can find them inside of volcanoes. You go a couple miles down into the ocean and you find a rift vent. And inside that rift vent, you will find these archaea. They're absolutely fascinating. And we know almost nothing about them, but we do know that they live inside of us. Wait, when did we find that out? In the last few years, much more recently than the bacteria thing. Yeah, because I'm going to be honest, there's It's not often that I learn something that I had absolutely no clue about, like never even heard the word. And, and now I'm fascinated. So we're getting into some archaea. All right. But what's number five bacteria. And number number five is viruses, which outnumber all the things that we just said. But you know, the, the focus when we talk about the gut microbiome is really predominantly on the bacteria, the bacterial community that lives inside of us, which makes up the vast majority of what we're talking 
about the, the most Americans probably do not have parasites. Um, there are a minority of fungi and even less of these archaea. And so if you exclude the, the viruses where the, the viruses are really a different entity because they're not a cellular organism, if you exclude the viruses and you talk about the other four, the other four, yeah, um, then then what you have is this is a predominantly bacterial community. Take your colon, for example. There are 40 to 50 trillion, 40 to 50 trillion bacteria inside your colon. This is actually the densest population of bacteria on the entire planet. Like take the gnarliest place that you can imagine, take, you know, take like the subway stop that's just absolutely disgusting and peed and pooped on. And there's way more bacteria inside of you personally than there is in that gnarly spot that you just imagined. Wow. And they're not just innocent bystanders. Like they have been with us since the beginning of human evolution. There was never a time where we as humans were sterile. It was never, it was never the case. They predate us humanity by such a long period of time. It's crazy. And so from the very beginning, you know, let's call it 3 million years of human evolution because it depends on which estimate you use. Sure. They were there with us and and we we learned to need each other. They provide skills that we are incapable of doing as human beings. And in turn, we provide an environment for them where they can thrive and frankly, we feed them. We eat food and the food goes down and they use that food as energy. And so, so the big breakthrough occurred in 2006, getting back to the original question, where you have to understand that like in 2006, we only knew of about 200 species of bacteria that colonized humans. And that's because those are the 200 species that we could grow in a lab, like grow on a, on a culture plate. Right. And then we discovered this technique that allowed us to find the bacteria that we characterize as being anaerobic, anaerobic. And basically what that means is they don't live in an environment where there's oxygen. You try to culture them on a culture plate, they can't live there because there's oxygen. And that is actually what most of our gut microbiota are made up of, our bacteria that are anaerobic. They can't live in an environment where there's oxygen. And so this laboratory technique allowed us to, for the first time, define these communities of bacteria. And instantly, like we went from 200 species of bacteria that we thought were involved with human, uh, the human microbiome to within a few years, we've identified 10,000. And there are estimates that there may be 35,000. Like imagine discovering 10,000 new animals. Right. And they're all packed into a like discrete space and, you know, competing with each other, bouncing off of each other, and you're trying to understand community dynamics of how they interact, that's where we are right now. Wow. That's what we're trying to do. Then how did we find out how important they are, right? Because I could imagine being like, well, we have a lot of bacteria, but eh, we know a little bit about bacteria, not a big deal. Now it's this idea, just what you said, the way they interact could potentially shape all of our health. I mean, it could shape almost all of us. How, how did we figure that out? Or, or, or why do they matter so much? Well, you know, basically from that point forward, now we have a, a laboratory technique that allows us to actually study these bacteria to identify their presence and start to then use like broaden out, you know, our research techniques to say, okay, now that we know they're there and we can measure them and things like that, Let's, let's use this information to try to understand things better. And so, you know, there wasn't like, hey, here's one study that came out that, you know, defined everything for us. Sure. There's some studies that are like complete game changers. And then there's others that just made a positive contribution, perhaps small. But, you know, what we do know now, here we are a little more than 10 years later, and we know that these this community of microorganisms plays a central role in your metabolism, um, the way that you process your food. So, you know, for example, like I, you and I are pretty similar in age. I'm sure you've noticed there are way more people with food sensitivities in 2018 than there ever were when we were kids. Right. You're right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everyone's like, I'm sensitive to this. I'm sensitive to that. I can't eat that. Well, guess what? That's because there's damage to the gut microbiome. 
that's because your gut and these communities of bacteria have become weak and they're not able to process those foods anymore. And, you know, spe speaking of our metabolism, there are these absolutely fascinating studies that have been reproduced like multiple times. I mean, this is not a fluke. This is something that's incredibly easy to do given the right equipment where they will take a mouse that is an obese mouse and they will transfer the bacteria from that obese mouse into a thin mouse and they will change absolutely nothing. This is done in a lab. They are controlling the calories. They're controlling exactly what the thin mouse eats. It eats the exact same thing, the exact same thing, the exact same amount and the thin mouse becomes obese. And they've reproduced that study where they take the bacteria from an obese human and they transfer it to a skinny mouse. And once again, the skinny mouse becomes obese. Okay, now that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, this is just crazy stuff. And so, you know, the gut microbiome controls our metabolism. Our immune system lives in our gut. Uh, you know, there are autoimmune diseases that exist today that were not around when you and I were kids. And I'll see them twice in the same day in my clinic. Wow. Wh and, which one specifically are those? Well, like an example is eosinophilic esophagitis. Wow. That's yep. so never heard of that. Esophagitis <laughs> didn't exist until the late nineties. Like there was not that name eosinophilic esophagitis did not exist. Hmm. And now I will see it twice in the same day. And, um, and what it comes back, back to is that our immune system lives in the gut. 70% of your immune system is hanging out there in your gut. You got to understand that this is the place of vulnerability for our body. This is where we are most vulnerable. Our skin is a wall. Mm -hmm. Our skin blocks things from getting in. Our gut is responsible for basically sorting through everything that we put into our mouth and swallow and deciding what is good, what is bad, what are we going to absorb, what are we going to try to get rid of? And so the immune system is there hanging out and it is separated from the gut microbiota, these bacteria, by a single layer of cells that is a fraction of the size of one strand of hair off your head. And they are in constant communication. It's like neighbors hanging out. You know, it's like two parties going on and there's a thin fence separating the two parties. The two parties are talking to each other. And we have tons of evidence that, they're, that when you damage the gut microbiota, when you damage these bacteria you are damaging the immune system. And so the immune system and its ability to function properly depends on a healthy gut. We also know that 95% of serotonin, which is the happy hormone, is produced in the gut. And so serotonin, um, you know, if I want to treat someone for depression, for example, I could give them Zoloft or Prozac or whatever. These medications are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They basically crank the serotonin up in the body. 95% of serotonin is not in the brain. Only 5% is in the brain. 95% of serotonin is in our gut. And the reason why is because serotonin essentially sets the rhythm on a local basis for your gut and how it moves. And so if there's not enough serotonin, what do you get? You get constipation. If there's too much serotonin, what do you get? You get diarrhea. Well, guess what? Like, irritable bowel syndrome, you know, there's a generation of doctors that grew up with the understanding and still to this day believe that IBS is just a manifestation of anxiety or neuroticism by the patient. But what about the fact that when you damage the gut, you damage serotonin and that would affect mood, that would produce anxiety or depression, and that affects GI motility and sensation. And so now we have a root cause for IBS that has nothing to do with, hey, the patient's crazy. Now we have a root cause that's real. We may not have a test for it, but this is real. This is what's going on. And, and then, you know, there's a bunch of other things. They, they are involved in producing vitamins, several of the vitamins in our body. Um, but the, the other thing that I want to just um, toss your way is that they play a huge part in our gene expression. So if you look at our genetic code, like they cracked our genetic code a little more than 15 years ago. Right. And when they did that, they thought that they were going to be able to fi figure everything out. And the results ended up being extremely disappointing because it's like you can define someone's genetics, but you can't tell what's going to happen in their life. People are not predestined. The vast majority of the time, our studies suggest 95% of the time you are predisposed 
based upon your genetic code, but not predestined. And so what controls the manifestation of disease, flipping the gene on or off with like a switch, which by the way, we know this is the way that it happens. We call it epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Genes can get flipped on or flipped off like a switch. Well, a good example of this is celiac disease. So celiac disease, there is a researcher at McMaster up in Ontario named Elena Verdu, who studied celiac disease and basically found that there are three criteria that people need to meet in order to develop the actual condition. Here they are. Number one, you need to have the gene for celiac disease. If you don't have it, you cannot have celiac disease. Well, one out of three people in the United States have this gene. So it's very common, one out of three people. Number two, you need to be exposed to gluten, which you find in wheat, barley, and rye. Well, guess what? Gluten is in like all kinds of food. Everything. Everything. Yeah. And so every single person growing up in the United States has been exposed to gluten. So that one, just check it off. We all have that. Mm -hmm. Number three, this is the game changer. It's changes in gut bacteria, damage to the gut microbiome, which we have a term for, dysbiosis a loss of the healthy balance in the gut, a loss of the um, appropriate healthy communities of gut bacteria. Dysbiosis is what actually flips that gene on. And so this is what causes celiac disease is basically damage to the gut microbiome and someone who carries the gene and has been exposed to gluten allows for the possibility of celiac disease to manifest. Now, most people who have the gene don't develop celiac disease. If you look statistically in the United States right now, one in three people have the gene and about one in a hundred people actually manifest the illness. But the issue is this, one in a hundred is way more than it was 50 years ago. See, and here's the thing, gluten and, and celiac, that's something that I feel like is, is utilized often to discuss uh, how the gut can you know, become damaged and, and all that. It seems like it's one of the ones that's studied most, it's kind of clear cut. But the reasoning behind the rise in it, I don't think can be anything from the, the type of wheat now to monocrops, to GMOs, to anything. What, what's the current research show on why that increase? I think that this is an area of hearty debate. And, um, you know, I don't know that there's one answer that is the, hey, this is the firm definitive right answer. But let me... Let me tell you what I think. Yeah. Um, I think that to pin it on like the types of wheat that we're eating is, it, has the wheat changed since our grandparents? Um, you know, I think, I don't think that that's really what it is. I think what we're seeing is that the, the full American lifestyle or call it a Western lifestyle has changed in the last 100 years. We have moved inside. We have developed powerful chemicals to clean our home, to clean our skin, our body in the shower. We have developed five or 6,000 chemical preservatives or additives or colorants that are put into our food. Um, we are no longer spending time in a garden, working with our hands or being outside. We're not sleeping as much. Um, we are clearly not exercising nearly as much. And then you do have the arrival of GMO crops recently, but I don't think that this is something that happened during um, just uh, our lifetime, to be honest with you. Right. What we're dealing with here is the progressive destruction of the healthy relationship that we have with these gut bacteria. And if you look at populations of people, because there, believe it or not, there are still um, tribal, tribal people that exist on this planet. They are unfortunately um, falling apart very quickly because, like a lot of them, get exposed to the modern lifestyle, to a diet coke or to an iPhone, mm -hmm. and they say, you know, forget this tribal life. I, I want that. I want the iPhone. I want the diet coke. But there are still populations of people in the Amazon rainforest and also in parts of Africa that are native tribal people like Tanzania is an example. And in these people called the Hudzu in Tanzania, if you study their microbiome, they have about 1600 species of bacteria inside of them. Now contrast that to study of us Americans, 
And what you will find is that we have somewhere between 300 and 1,000 species. So the best of us is already missing 600 species relative to these native tribal people that are living the way that we lived for 99% of human history. Mm. And what we see in our studies is that when you lose diversity in the gut, meaning you lose these populations of bacteria, you reduce that number of species down from 1,000 to 900, 800, 700, keep dropping it. When you do that, at some point, you reach a tipping point where your gut is not able to keep up with what your body is asking it to do, what your body needs it to do. And then disease shows up. And so this loss of diversity is what we see in these autoimmune diseases. It's been associated with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, but, and, and celiac disease, but also autoimmune diseases that are outside of the gut, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. We also, by the way, see similar types of things. Like to use the word dysbiosis is to use a very broad descriptive term, but it means this. It means the loss of diversity within the gut. We see dysbiosis is associated with so many other conditions. It's associated with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, ADD, mm -hmm. autism, you know, all of these different things throughout the entire body. And this is demonstrating to us the importance of gut health, which is that when you damage the gut, bad things happen. And so one of the things that I would point out to say that this is not just your, our generation, this is not just our generation, is that we have data, like this is an impossible study to do in humans because we live far too long and it takes way too long for us to procreate. Right. But in mice, there are clear cut studies that show us that there can be loss of bacterial species across generations. So if grandma had a thousand species, but grandma is now like, you know, drinking soda and eating processed food and spending less time outside in the garden. And grandma goes from a thousand species down to 800. And then grandma has mom and mom starts off with 800 species. Yeah. And the same process repeats itself where now we've even umped the ante even more. I mean, I think you would agree with me that in the last 100 years, these trends that I'm defining of more chemicals, more preservatives, more additives, um, less time outside, less sleep less exercise, like all of these things, more processed foods, um, less natural foods, like the average American, here's our diet. Let me lay it out right now. The average American in the United States is getting 65% of their calories from processed foods. We don't even know what's in there. Mm. Like we don't even know what those things do. There are no human studies to demonstrate safety for these five or 6,000 chemicals. And they're getting about 25% of their calories from animal products, meat and dairy. And what that leaves is 10% of an American's calories are coming from fresh fruits and vegetables. And that is completely upside down because when you look at the healthiest populations in the world, for example, I don't know if you've read the book, The Blue Zones by Dan Buettner. Oh yeah, we had him on the show. Perfect. Yeah. So, so to recap real quick for your um, listeners who, who haven't read this book, they should. This is a great, this is, this is a great book. Dan Buettner is not a medical doctor. He is a guy who worked with National Geographic, and he asked a very interesting question about a little over 10 years ago, which was, what are the healthiest populations in the world, and how do they live? What is their life like? And he identified five specific populations that, first, it was a National Geographic article, and subsequently, he turned it into this book that they called the Blue Zones. These are five populations the blue zone is defined because they marked it on a map with the blue marker. And these are specific locations. It's not countries. These are specific places that they marked on the map. And so the five locations are the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Sardinia, Icaria, which is an island in Greece, Okinawa, Japan, and finally, Loma Linda, California, which is where the Seventh-day Adventists live. And they're a very interesting population because they live with us in the United States. And aren't they all vegetarians? The vast majority are either vegan or vegetarian. Yeah, and the minority are pescatarian. Okay. And they, their theology, their faith system teaches them that they will come back to re-inhabit their body. And so part of their culture is to take care of their body because they expect to come back to re-inhabit it. And so they have this culture of eating healthy. And what's fascinating is they live with us. They drink the same water we do. They right. they eat the same fruits and vegetables that we do. They live 10 years longer than we do. 
And when you look at these blue zones, each one of them, these are these are populations living way longer than in the United States. Like Costa Rica, this third world country people, like they don't have access to healthcare like we do. Yeah. They don't have doctors that have trained for 16 years like me. Right. And and so you look at these five populations and what Dan Butner found is striking similarities in the way that all five of these populations were living, even though culturally speaking, these are completely separate places. And every single one of them is 90 plus percent plant-based, 90 plus percent plant-based. And what was fascinating about that to me is that if you get into the science of the microbiome and you start to ask questions about what fosters a healthy gut, well, let's answer that. There is a researcher at the University of California, San Diego. His name is Rob Knight. The dude is incredible. Like this is one of my modern day heroes because he, he is redefining our understanding of the human body. And I have no clue what Rob Knight eats. And I don't <laughs> think that he had any agenda whatsoever. He's just a guy who's brilliant. And he has a national database from our country because he's done something called the American Gut Project where your listeners, if they want to do this, you can do this. Go to americangutproject.org. You pay less than 100 bucks, and they will send you a kit so that you can have your microbiome defined using this kit. And then you also fill out a survey that they use for research purposes to try to understand better what is our lifestyle as it correlates with our microbiome. Have you actually, have you heard of Ubiome? Yeah, Ubiome is very similar. Okay. Very similar. All right, because yep. I actually did that, and it was free. And it was free because I think they're trying to do the same thing at the moment. I, I don't really yeah. know. They've run some specials at times where you may be able to do it for free. I think okay. generally you buy them is 89 bucks. Oh, okay. okay. Um, don't quote me on that. Check their website, but sure. it's, it's conceptually the same thing. Okay. And so, so Rob Knight has this database from across the entire country of people that have submitted this information to him and for research purposes. And um, he stood up at the podium at the biggest GI meeting of 2017. And the question was, what is the number one predictor of, of a healthy gut? And again, like I, I have no reason to believe that he has an agenda. This was just punch the numbers into the formula and see what the black box spits out. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the question is the diversity of the plants that you eat. All right. So wait, let's get into this um, because I've recently done a number of kind of diet changes. And one of the things I've found, so for example, for months and months, I cut out everything except vegetables, meat, and fats, I believe it was. So it's called the autoimmune protocol, which I'm sure you've heard of. Sure. Um, and it's hard to get calories and that's just with, and that's adding meat in there. How do you get enough calories eating 90% plants? I just don't understand it. To answer your question, where do you get your calories from? Well, you know, let me say this, first of all, like for every single person who's sitting here listening to this right now, I am telling you right now, I do not want you to finish this podcast and today is the first day of veganism for you. And the reason why I say that is that although I am a real true believer that this science is completely real, like if you look into this, this science is completely real um, and that we should all strive to increase our plant and uh, our plant, you know, consumption, our diversity of plants, we need to give our body time to adapt. And so like for me personally, my journey, I, you know, you rewind five or six years and I was eating absolute trash. Like I was famous among my friends for the way that I ate Captain D's like all the time. It was disgusting. <laughs> and, um, as I started to, uh, become conscious of these things that were the science that was coming out and seeing this, seeing, you know, what the gut, the story that the gut microbiome was telling me, this is part of what motivated me to make changes and move towards a plant focused diet. And it's been, it was a gradual process for me that took a couple of years to really get to a place where it was a much more dominant part of the way that I was eating. And so, but to answer your question, you know, if you are consuming a diversity of plants, like you're not going to be able to do this tomorrow. You'll feel horrible if you do, if you try to do it that, that quickly. But 
with time, it's actually incredibly easy. Like I, today for lunch, I loaded up a monstrous salad. And so, you know, I probably had 12 or 14 different plants on the salad. I had four different types of beans and every single type of beans I put three scoops on. Mm. And so there's plenty of calories and energy within that salad. But if you're not used to eating that way, it's your body needs an opportunity to adapt. And again, like that, that's actually your gut microbiome speaking to you, by the way. Right. If you're not used to eating a certain way and you try to change very quickly, that's that's because your gut microbiome is not built for that. The other question is, how do you get a big, a, a good diversity? Because, for example, I go to Whole Foods. I mean, that's as, as and I'm privileged to be able to do that. But even that isn't going to give you anything close to what they have in Tanzania or, or what we should be aiming for. You know, I just it gets so massive to try to do this that I think that is what frustrates people. Don't don't get overwhelmed by the concept. Um, I would start with that. And, you know, these people in Tanzania, um, it is not actually the for them. I think it's that their lifestyle is completely different than ours. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're, they've never come into contact with a single processed food. They've never come into contact with antibiotics for better or for worse. Um, they uh, live in huts and, you know, have like dirt floors and they literally sit around and chew roots yeah. all day long. Yeah. And these people, when they study them, these people are consuming 100 to 150 grams of fiber per day. Insane. And the average American, like the average woman in the United States is consuming about 18 grams of fiber and the average man about 22. And so th it is a complete, you know, difference there. Um, I don't think that you, it's necessary to overwhelm yourself with, I can't, you know, I can't make myself that perfect and therefore I'm not going to try. Right. I think it's more just a frame of mind where, this is the way that I started thinking about it when I started to make these shifts and these transitions is I, I am now understanding that these are nutrient dense foods. I never thought about it that way, but I'm now understanding that these are nutrient dense foods. These are high in nutrients. They have so many vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, like phytochemicals are chemicals that you can only find in these plants that have health benefits. Um, and so, you know, the shift for me was more of a frame of mind of, look, I have the opportunity to eat something that actually is going to make me more healthy. And if I forego that opportunity, then I'm opting for things that actually may take away health for me, you know, like processed food. Mm -hmm. And so having that frame of mind, when I sit down to have a, have a meal that allowed me to start to focus more on, okay, well, there's the healthy food right there. I'm going to try to get a little bit more of that on my plate. And it was just a gradual process. Getting diversity, I mean, look, if, you know, your idea of being plant-based is to have iceberg lettuce with a cucumber and some tomatoes on it three times a day, but that's not what it is. Um, and, you know, you start to incorporate all these different foods into your diet. This is the reason why, by the way, not to divert onto a different topic, but I feel like it's a controversy that needs to be addressed. This is the reason why I, I cannot support elimination diets mm -hmm. of any variety. Mm. Because the, the elimination diets consistently show us, all of them, the same thing, whether you are gluten-free or you are low FODMAP and using low FODMAP to eliminate foods, or you are Whole30, when you eliminate foods from your diet, the microbiome suffers. Our studies across all of those, all those diets that I just mentioned have shown us that. When you eliminate foods from your diet, the microbiome suffers. And so we can't be eliminating foods. We don't have that margin of error to be able to do that. We can't be causing more harm to our microbiome and hoping that it's just going to turn out okay. And so that's where we need to not be eliminating foods. Like even if you do a diet, for example, a gluten-free diet, if you want to do gluten-free diet, 100% be my guest and eliminate the refined, the refined foods, the refined grains. Like 100% get rid of those processed foods. But I don't think it's a good idea to eliminate whole wheat, whole barley, uh, whole rye, like or the minimally processed stuff. And our studies clearly show that, that, that it supports the microbiome and these whole grains are needed. Oh, man. All right, Dr. B. Now, now, 
you just did it. You just dropped the mic, right? That that flies in the face of a lot of the popular diets. Well, yeah, the popular diets, but even some of the prominent people in this field. And mind you, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on, I do feel that a lot of the prominent people in this field aren't necessarily based in research. And yeah. and and we'll just leave it there. But so take something like gluten, for example. Obviously, if you're celiac, you cut it out. But you 100% cut it out. There's no question there. But what about gluten sensitivities? Or as you mentioned, you see autoimmune patients. I mean, I've I've heard people back it up with science and everything go as far as saying any person with an autoimmune disease should never eat gluten. I, I mean, I, I can't I, I cannot agree with that. OK, now I do think let, let's try to tease this out a little bit because we shouldn't be painting with uh, super broad strokes here. There's there's layers to this that are worthy of discussion. And so, you know, think about gluten comes from three sources, wheat, barley, rye. Now tell me when the last time was that you ate like literally wheat without processing it or literally barley without processing it. No one's doing that. It's always a processed food, right? It's always a processed food. And when we process our food, to my knowledge, there is only one form of food processing that makes it more healthy than when it started. And that is fermentation. Mm. If you ferment your food, you can make it more healthy than when you started. But beyond that, any food processing, the way that I think about things is as you process your food, you are losing nutrients and you are adding in preservatives or additives or colorants or whatever it may be. And at some point, it crosses the line and stops being a healthy food and starts being an unhealthy food. But the science here does not lie. The science tells us very clearly that people who go 100% gluten-free, their microbiome becomes less diverse. It's clear cut. You know, and it's funny you say that I've had this thought. I've had this thought because as I mentioned, I've tried a number of diets and really just trying to see how do I feel, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they'll say, well, you might eat something. And if you notice it if impacts you negatively, then that means you shouldn't have eaten it, Right. So say I've cut out beans because of lectins and then I go, okay, I'm going to reintroduce them and I have beans and then I get stomach pains and I'm like, wait, this is, this is ridiculous because six months ago, beans did not cause stomach pains. So I, it, that, that kind of confused me. And then also yeah. learning that, break that down? yeah, definitely. But, but to add on to that, learning that, uh, prior to this interview and you kind of reiterate that, that certain bacteria feed off certain food. If you eat a lot of sugar, you're going to get bacteria that like sugar. If you eat a lot of exactly grains, right. you're going to get a lot of bacteria that eat grains, et cetera. But then I was thinking exactly right. if diversity is, is the goal and you cut those things out, those bacteria will die. But my understanding was that some of those are the bad bacteria. That's so right. There's good guys go and bad with guys. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, first of all, let me, let me start. Okay. So that's, that's a lot to unpack, but yeah. let me start off with this. We need to be very careful about defining the way that a food makes us feel as being the indicator of whether or not it is good or bad for us. And so I don't want to upset or insult your listeners who may believe in this. But for example, bulletproof coffee makes people feel great. I don't think that there's a person on this planet that doesn't feel a positive difference when they use bulletproof coffee. But there is nothing healthy about that. <laughs> there is nothing healthy about bulletproof coffee other than if you were to take away the butter and the medium chain triglycerides from the coconut oil and leave just the black coffee, then I think you would actually have something that's there and healthy. And so, you know, just because something makes you feel good, cocaine makes you feel good. It does not mean that it's good for you. Hmm. And on the flip side, things that make you feel bad, we have to be able to, to understand that these foods that cause gas or abdominal discomfort, and we're not tolerating them, that's because there's complexity to processing those foods. It doesn't mean that we're incapable of tolerating that food and that we should eliminate it. If we eliminate it, then we have given up on that entire community of microorganisms that would feast off of that food. Instead, what we need to do is build up and strengthen that community of microorganisms by starting off off with a minimal amount of that particular food and then easing our body into it. It takes time. You have to reintroduce the food. But if you eliminate the food, 
you will you are going to feel better in the short term and you I, i'm just telling you from the science there's a price that is paid in the long term hmm. and you dig yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into the hole until all of a sudden now we have people who like can't tolerate any food and they and they want to understand like how did i get to this place and why can i tolerate any food and part of the story i hate to say it are these elimination diets that people are doing along the way thinking that they're doing good for their body because they don't have as much gas and bloating by cutting out all of these plant-based foods. So tell us about the bad bacteria then. Because, so for example, sugar, right? I think everyone can agree, and I have a feeling that sugar is going to be, you know, public enemy number one and, and continue to be so for a while. Um, but if you have certain bacteria or yeast that, that focus on sugars and you eat a lot of it, then aren't you supporting those bacteria, therefore increasing diversity, However, they're not the bacteria you want. So th there are some you want to get out, I'm assuming. Yeah. And, and, and so the truth is that, you know, you don't want to support those bad bacteria. Um, these are our body shows us clear cut differences in the way that these bacteria behave. I mean, to, to sort of put it in layman's terms, there's good guys and there's bad guys. And the good guys are there to do things that promote your health, that make your body function the way that it's supposed to. And I want to talk more about the characteristics of the good guys in a moment, but first we'll pay some attention to the bad guys, which is that they're inflammatory. They're inflammatory. They don't make your immune system work the way that it's supposed to. If anything, they fire the immune system up. And so what we see in our studies is that there is, if you were to take the, the gut microbiome, it's essentially a spectrum. There is a spectrum where there is the ideal gut microbiome. And I, by the way, I'm happy to send you the reference for this so that you can post it for people that are skeptical. They can read this. Yeah, let's do it. I want to read it. So that's another um, <laughs> There is a spectrum that exists of the gut microbiome. And if you were to say what is on the extreme end of the negative spectrum, I would argue that it's the standard American diet. It's the 65% processed foods, it's the 25% animal products, and it's the measly 10% of, of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And on the other end of the spectrum, what they have found is the closer that you become to being plant-based, the healthier the gut becomes. And that is because what you have are, this is now getting into the, the part of nutrition and the, the, um, the nutrient that is my absolute favorite that no one is talking about, which is something called short chain fatty acids. Mm. When we talk about fiber, we misuse, including doctors, including me a couple of years ago, we misuse the term fiber. Um, not all fiber is created equal. You just can't, you can't just count the number of grams of fiber and pretend that it's all the same. That's not the way that this works. Using the word fiber is similar to using the word protein. Would anyone claim that the protein in a bean is the same as a protein that's in a hamburger? I don't think anyone would. They're clearly different. And the same is true for fiber in the sense that there are many, many, many different types of fiber that you find. And each plant is going to have different types. And this is where the diversity of the plants comes into play is each, each type of plant that you bring to the table is going to have different types of these nutrients, but also fiber that promote a healthy gut. Fiber is not in one end and out the other. I thought when I completed all of my medical training that that's what the story was. Fiber helps you poop. Right. Fiber is a plug that pushes stuff out. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought when I completed all my training. And I now understand that that's not the way that it works. And there are specific types of fiber, which we refer to as prebiotic, P-R-E, mm -hmm. biotic, as opposed to probiotic. And the prebiotics feed and nourish the healthy bacteria in our gut. That is, by definition, what a prebiotic is, is, is basically the food source for the healthy bacteria that live in your gut. Prebiotics can come in many different types, but the predominant form is coming from the fiber particularly soluble fiber that you find in plants. And what happens is the soluble fiber, by the way, the same story is true for resistant starch for the people who are fans of resistant starch at home. The soluble fiber passes all the way through your stomach and your small intestine completely unchanged and it hits the colon. And when it hits the colon, these bacteria 
transform it from fiber into short chain fatty acids. Examples of this are butyrate, acetate, propionate. And these short chain fatty acids, if you go and read about what they do, you're going to say, I want more of those. They prime our immune system, regulate our immune system, allow it to work the way that it's supposed to. They reduce our blood sugar, prevent type 2 diabetes. They lower our cholesterol. They prevent cancer. And again, they build up the healthy bacteria in our gut. This is the energy source for the bacteria in our gut, our short chain fatty acids. Now, if you take the same amount of soluble fiber, the same amount of prebiotic, and you give that soluble fiber to someone who is vegan, and you compare that to someone who is keto and not eating any fruits and vegetables, because there are some people who are keto and eat their fruits and vegetables. Mm. But if you give that same amount of soluble fiber, you are going to see tremendous differences in the ability to harvest these short chain fatty acids. And they've measured that. They've looked at different diets and the ability to produce these short chain fatty acids. And the bottom line is when you prime the gut with the right types of bacteria, they are built to process these foods and they get the most out of it. But on the flip side, if you have bacteria that are designed to process fat, designed to process sugar, these are inflammatory bacteria, and they're going to excrete, they're going to draw every single calorie and every single bit of inflammation that they can out of that food. And this is the reason why it's hard for people to find studies with these foods that many people love. But it's hard to find studies that actually demonstrate a health benefit other than to pick out a particular nutrient and say, hey, it's got this nutrient, and because it has this nutrient, it must be good. That's not the way that food works. You've got to take whole foods and show me what happens when you consume the whole food. You see what I'm saying? I do, yeah. So wh wh give me an example of a food that's high in short-chain fatty acids. Well, um, the easiest would be to, to, to use the fiber inulin, I-N-U-L-I-N. -I yeah, I've heard of that. And so this is a specific type of fiber. You can get it as a supplement, by the way. It's extremely gas-producing. If people are like interested in trying this out, it's... There's better prebiotics if you're worried about getting bloated. And But anyway, inulin you'll find in Jerusalem artichokes, um, jicama, asparagus, garlic. So there's all of these plant-type foods that offer this specific inulin. Some of the literature, when they talk about prebiotics, they tend to fixate on specifically inulin. But let me just tell you that there are a lot of prebiotics that exist way beyond inulin. And you're going to find them in these foods. You're going to find them in these plant foods. And so you don't need to worry about saying, I'm going to ramp up my Jerusalem artichoke intake. That's not what this is about. This is, this is about taking advantage of the health advantages, uh, taking advantage of what you get from multiple, multiple different fruits and vegetables being processed and digested in your gut, each of which is bringing a different blend and combination of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and different types of fiber. Right. There's there's two things that are st sticking out to me because now I'm really curious about this. I mean, I'm not kidding when I've gone down some crazy rabbit holes when it comes to diet and, and we've had people on and it is frustrating to get different, just all the different things out there. Right. And that's what this show is for. You know, it's, it's to, it's to expose ourselves to different educated people and to then make hopefully educated decisions. Sure. So, um, one thing you mentioned earlier was the increase in food sensitivities. Yeah. And that is something that I'm trying to figure out because I have taken, uh, multiple food sensitivity tests. Again, I'm kind of like a, a freak when it comes to this, like a Tim Ferriss type. I think the first one I took was over 12 years ago. And I remember they said, well, you, you can't, you shouldn't eat eggs. Uh, you shouldn't eat dairy. But then it got weird. It was like cranberries, like you react to cranberries and banana and rice. It just okay. And I was like, I was like, no, for, forget yeah. that. Okay. So right. then about six years later, I take it again and similar foods and different ones. Right. And then I take it again two years later, similar foods and different ones. So here's the thing. I have never in my life had digestive issues ever. I always said I had like an iron stomach. I don't get gas. I don't do this. I mean, not going into it too much. So I'm wondering how, what are these sensitivities? How is that real? And what is going on? You mentioned there's this increase in food sensitivities. And I think you were referring to the kind that, that are noticeable, right? right. Um, but how do you feel about this testing for food sensitivities? Uh, to be completely honest with you, 
I, I don't think I would recommend that you do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason why is because there are people like people are very, very interested in this topic. I have a bazillion patients who um, want the, the food sensitivity panel to be done to help to guide their diet. But here's the problem. So if it says that you're sensitive to this, like we're not talking about allergies, right? you know, and right. an allergy is like your lips swell up, your throat closes off. That, that's real. And that slaps you in the face and you know, there's a problem. We're talking about a sensitivity. Well, a sensitivity by definition is you are sensitive. Like you should feel something. And so the problem with those panels is if it says that you are sensitive to something, but you're not, well, that's not helpful. And if it says that you're not sensitive to something, but you eat it and you feel horrible, mm-hmm. that's not helpful either. Right. And so, you know, at the end of the day, if you really want to define where your sensitivities lie, what I would suggest for, for your listeners is to get hooked up with a really good nutritionist that you have confidence in. And I would actually start with the low FODMAP diet. And so for people that are not familiar with this, I did make a a reference to this earlier when we were talking about elimination diets, low FODMAP. FODMAP is an acronym that stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And basically, if you think about all those words, you keep hearing saccharide, that refers to sugars. We're not talking about white sugar here. We're talking about like sugar within our food, like fructose is an example. Mm or lactose, which is in milk and dairy. And so, well, FODMAPs are the part of our food that people tend to be sensitive to. This is the reason why some people can't tolerate, people who are lactose intolerant can't tolerate much dairy because they get symptoms because they can't process the lactose. Now, to my knowledge, as of like tonight, that is the only testing that is actually accurate, which is lactose intolerance testing. And Mm -hmm. that is real. You can do that. But in terms of processing all of these other FODMAPs, we don't have a test to tell us which one you have a problem with. But this is where the problems tend to lie. And this is part of the reason why when people, you know, unfortunate from my perspective, start to eliminate whole grains or eliminate um, uh, beans, legumes, things like that they may temporarily feel better because they're eliminating the FODMAPs that come with those foods, but they're doing harm to their microbiome in the long run because they are no longer getting the benefits of what those foods bring to the table for the gut microbiome. And so if you want to approach the food sensitivity problem, what I would propose or suggest for people is this, you get hooked up with a good nutritionist and you use this low FODMAP diet, which you can get off the internet, as a guide to help you to identify where your real food sensitivities lie. And then what you do, if it's a good nutritionist, they're going to tell you the point is not for you to permanently eliminate those foods. That would be a mistake. The point is to use that guide when you have worked with this diet and keep basically a journal for yourself of what you're eating and how it affects you. The point is to use that guide to moderate your food. You need to reintroduce. And when you reintroduce, you start off at a small portion size and you work your way up. Mm, I like that. I like that. I, I'm familiar with the FODMAP. And so that's an interesting one for our listeners to to look into. But you got to be careful with the FODMAP. I'll just say that real quick. Like sure. There's a lot of people using the FODMAP. There's a lot of people using these diets. Sure. And if you're not if you're not careful with it, you know, this is where harm can be done is if you're, you know, there are, I mean, I, you know this, that if you're if you're searching for a certain opinion on the internet, you'll find it. You're going to find it. <laughs> and so there's a bazillion people out there that will tell you, yeah, like I felt so much better eliminating all these foods. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess time will tell. I wish them well, but I'm just telling you the science does not support that. You know, we have to at least end it on what we can do. And we've talked about kind of the things I think most people know, right? Eat more fruits and veggies and and specifically a diversity of those. We talked a little bit about prebiotics. And we don't need to spend a lot of time on prebiotics or probiotics, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking kind of a twofold thing. One, what are some other suggestions you have that you give to your patients, to people in increasing gut health in general, since that's your thing? And then also, where, what's your stance on supplements? It could, be, it could be probiotics. It could be any type of gut healing supplement, you know, good ones, bad ones. So I'll leave that up to you. All right. 
So let's um, let, let's tackle the supplement question first because it's quick and we can just pick that off and then move on to the bigger question, which is take home points. What can you actually do to help to foster a healthy gut for your listeners? Um, supplements are what the word is defined as. They're a supplement. Like this cannot be the backbone of your health. The people who use 10 or 15 supplements, I am not going to be in agreement with that because you don't know what the side effects are. They do have side effects. Mm -hmm. They do have interactions with your body. They have interactions with each other and they can have interactions with your drugs. And it actually makes it much more complicated in some regards because you don't even necessarily know what's in the supplement. If you look at some of the third party, you know, consumer report type stuff where they look at this and they many times find things that you don't expect. So I do think though, to be fair, that there is a place for supplements. But that's not the first line treatment. The first line treatment is you got to get your lifestyle right. You have to focus on your lifestyle. And to me, diet is number one. And then there's other things that come after diet. But the food that you eat is going to be the ultimate predictor of the constitution of your gut microbiome. Show me what you eat and I'll tell you what your gut microbiome looks like. Show me what your gut microbiome looks like and I can probably tell you what your food is. And so that's where people really need to start. But I, but there are definitely supplements that I am in agreement with. Like, for example, I think vitamin D is fantastic. Yeah. And I really think everyone needs to be on vitamin D and not at the little dinky 400 IU doses <laughs> that people are tossing around. Like you go outside and you get sun exposure and you get way more, more vitamin D in 15 minutes in South Carolina where I live than, than you would from, you know, 400 IUs. Like that's crazy. Yeah. So there are some supplements that I'm wholeheartedly um, behind. I do think that there's potentially benefit to prebiotics if you're doing your diet right. And I do think that there's potentially benefit to probiotics. Um, although I will say there was a study that just came out recently in the last two weeks. Um, this is going to be a rare, rare complication, but people that had something called brain fog when they took a probiotic. Yeah. And so this is not going to be like 5% of people. But we need to be aware that everything has side effects. If you mm. put it into your mouth and you swallow it down, whether it's a prescription, a supplement, some natural product, or it's food, no matter what it is, it's going to have potential consequences. And so we all need to be aware of that. Um, when it comes to building a healthy gut, you know, I already said the backbone of a healthy gut is the food that you eat. And it's very clear to us that the diversity of the plants, we need to ramp that up. 10% is not going to cut it. And I will make a... I will make an honest uh, opinion that this is part, this is the driving influence from my perspective of disease in America. It is the absence of an adequate intake of fiber, but I don't mean grams. I mean fiber that you find in a diversity of fruits and vegetables. I really think this is what's driving all of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, there are other things that, that you can do, obviously. And, you know, it's fascinating when you start to think about these lifestyle things. And again, what you and I were discussing earlier in the podcast, the changes in the last 100 years to our lifestyle. For example, when you exercise, there are changes in gut bacteria. Hmm. And what is it that happens? Believe it or not, you get more bacteria that harvest short chain fatty acids. Mother nature is telling you right now, this is a priority. This is, this is one of the priorities is getting these short chain fatty acids because when you exercise, that's the response that you get in your gut is that you are more capable of harvesting short chain fatty acids from your foods. And again, it has to be prebiotic foods to get that benefit. Right. So exercise clearly is one of them. Sleep. When people sleep, there is actually improvement of the gut bacteria. And so we need to make sure we're getting adequate amounts of rest and taking that one step for, for further beyond just sleep. We don't have human studies yet. But we have good animal studies that are showing us that time-restricted eating is actually very good for the gut. And to me, it makes a lot of sense. So when I say time-restricted eating, what I mean is this. You allow yourself an eight-hour window for all of your food consumption. Mm. And so maybe that starts at 10 o'clock and it continues until 6 p.m. or something like that. And then you take a 16-hour break. And our studies make it very clear that by resting the gut, there is improvement of the gut bacteria. And I think about it when, and these data are like coming out right now, this is new stuff. I think about it like if I go and I lift my chest tonight, 
am I doing better for myself by lifting my chest again tomorrow or am I better off taking four days off? Yeah. You see, and so you got to give your body a break. And that's something that we didn't really understand. But if you think about sort of human evolution and where we were for um, 99% of human history as hunters and gatherers, we weren't living in current times where you have access to food at all times. Right. We were living in food. And so our body was getting that rest, that break. Yeah, I've heard of that. And that's one that, again, just the logic stuck with me in that, you know, you eat and then you have to allow your body the time to digest it. And then once it's done digesting, the time to heal and it can't heal while digesting. And so right. it, just that right in one sentence, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yep, totally. Yeah. And so and then, you know, beyond this, um, some things that the science is not wholeheartedly there, but I think that almost everyone who's listening would um, agree is not really that controversial and we just need the science to cut, catch up. Uh, first of all, fermented foods. I think that, you know, we need to reincorporate fermented foods. This was a part of human evolution. Every single culture in human history consumed fermented foods until about 100 years ago and we, when we invented preservatives. Mm and refrigerators and we no longer needed to ferment our food to preserve it um, but the reality is that fermentation is um, an expression of the relationship that our gut has with our food it's essentially pre-digestion of our right, food right and so i think that's one thing that people need to think about and like for example i make my own kombucha my own sauerkraut um i love it i actually made i made my own kombucha for about two years and the reason I had to stop, we have a kind of a small kitchen and my wife got really sick of looking at this massive jug that had this <laughs> jellyfish floating in it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is a little intimidating. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, and then, uh, stuff that we don't, um, have necessarily studies to back up, but again, I don't think I'm being very controversial here. Like, I really think that there's benefit to just getting outside getting outside, getting like, uh, we do have studies that demonstrate that when you get within five feet of a tree and your body is interacting with the microbes that live on that tree. What? And so, so I do think that like getting outside and I personally have started dabbling in some gardening, which mm -hmm. sounds weird. <laughs> like, what's the, what's this young guy like, you know, doing, I don't no, know. man, that's the new thing. I, we got, we have a little garden. I want to live on a farm. That's the goal. Yeah. So, and I loved going out there and just put, sinking my hands into the soil and just interacting with it. And I don't go inside and then slap down Purell. Um, <laughs> speaking of which, like clearly stay away from Purell. That's not good. Um, and the other thing is we should, you know what? I can't believe we're waiting to the last minute for me to say this. Oh. But let me get this out. Yeah. We should have talked about antibiotics and it's my bad. I should have taken no, this there. You know, I had antibiotics written down, but there's so yeah. much stuff here. Yeah. We covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. I mean, we talked about 3 million years of human evolution. We right. talked about five blue zones. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Anyway, let, let's touch on that real quick. I got to get it. this out. All right. So first, let me say this. Like I am not anti-antibiotic. Like, hey, never take antibiotics. Okay. Um, the greatest, the greatest breakthrough in human history in terms of adding years to our life expectancy was the discovery of penicillin. Instantly, we added 15 years to our life expectancy. Wow. And I don't think you'll ever see anything like that during our lifetime. Mm -hmm. 15 years like that yeah. overnight. Um, the problem is that when you got something that's that good, you lean on it way too much. You become dependent on it and you don't necessarily understand how something that may be, again, one of the themes from our conversation, something that may feel good in the short term can be bad in the long term. And now here we are, and we have actual data to show us what happens to the microbiome. And, and it's not good. Um, what we see is, for example, take Cipro, which I would characterize as a middle-of-the-road antibiotic. There are a ton of people who use this to treat a simple urinary tract infection. Cipro for, for five days, which many times it's prescribed for up to even 14. I mean, seven to 14 days is normal. Five days of Cipro wipes out 35% of the bacteria in your gut. And what's worse is the fallout. So you wipe out 35%. Guess what's left? 65% that are Cipro resistant. Oh, right. And they are going to start taking space and dominating. And they are much more powerful now than they were before. 
And our studies also show us that although the number of bacteria may bounce back very quickly after you stop the antibiotic, it could take literally up to two years to reharmonize the way that you had it before. So when you hear about people who take, you know, an antibiotic and then develop Crohn's disease, now you understand why. Yep. Yep. Man. So I'll leave it at that. I just dropped the mic. So let's let's get to this part because there needs to be more from you out in the world. And maybe there is, but maybe we don't know about it. So first, I know your website is theguthealthmd.com. What, what's going on with you? How are you getting this into the world? You know, how are you fighting the good fight against the incorrect information that lives on the internet? Well, um, this was, I've, I, let me just tell you, like, we didn't really get into this, but this was not my plan. Um, you know, I, I guess kind of what happened for me is I finished my training. I went into the real world. I was practicing. I started to see this science coming out. I started to become interested and I did all of this independent study at night to learn about nutrition and the gut microbiome. And what's cool is that I have a background in research. Um, I have a master's degree in clinical research from North, from Northwestern. I worked at the UNC School of Public Health, which is one of the top two schools of public health in the country. And so I finally was able to apply those things in a way that I was passionate and excited about and I was using it in my clinic. And I just felt like, you know what? Um, there's way too much for me to say about this than to just limit it to a 15 or 30 minute visit in my office behind a closed door. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started my Instagram account two years ago, just to share this message. And now it's kind of getting a little bit crazy and picking up steam. And I am closing in very quickly on 15,000 followers. And, um, and so that really is where it all started for me was on the Instagram account. Mm -hmm. And, but like, I love coming on podcasts like this one with you and having this conversation because you can't get from one post on Instagram enough of the story to make it make sense. But when I come on a podcast and we have a good high quality evidence-based science, science supported uh, conversation for an hour or an hour and a half, People are now getting the whole story and I think that they understand better. And what's cool is, you know, for me, what's cool is like, this is not a money-making venture for me. If I wanted to make money, I would double down in my office. I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah, totally. So, but, but what, what's exciting for me about this is this has started to take off for me. It's bringing attention to me and this message that I'm trying to share. But at the end of the day, like, I, I can rest really easy and feel really good because I'm bringing everyone who listens to me, I'm bringing you the truth as I see it. And I, I, I don't, you know, time will tell if I'm a hundred percent correct, but you know, I did all this training and here I am using these skills to try to spread this message and people are making changes as a result of that. And that gets me like super excited. And I feel so good when I hear back from people that they enjoyed the podcast and because of that, they're making, you know, X, Y, and Z change, whatever that may be. Like, like I said before, you don't need to walk away from this podcast and become vegan, but I do think that you should increase your plant consumption. I guess I'll leave it at that. Sure. So we have the website, which is the gut health MD.com. And then your Instagram account is at the gut, the health, gut MD. health MD, right? That's right. And the, yep. is that your primary place? Or are you doing the, the Twitter, Facebook blogging? I mean, what would you recommend? I know you can sign up for your newsletter on the website. Yeah, you can sign up for my newsletter, which is uh, which is different than what you get in terms of Instagram content. Um, if you are more of a Facebook person than an Instagram person, then you can follow me on Facebook. It's the same thing at the Gut Health MD. Okay. Um, but uh, really, my content is built for Instagram, and that's where most of the conversation is occurring right now. And you know. Um, I guess I would say, I don't know what the future holds. This has been crazy. I didn't think I was going to build a website or start, you know, devoting, like building time into my practice schedule so that I can do this. I didn't right. think I could do any of those things. And so I don't know what the future completely holds, but, you know, I hope that some of the people who are listening at home, if you enjoy what I'm talking about, can join me on, the, on you know, and just kind of see what happens. Who knows? Well, I really respect that. And I, I, I honestly wish you the best of luck. I mean, the amount of people I interview or read about or learn about, I think I get a pretty good BS detector. And I just have to say, I, you know, I know 
your background in research and what it lends itself to, I know that the first thing you did was not try to sell your own supplements, which is what you could do. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's like, okay, now we've got a, a doctor, uh, a doctor B probiotic, you know, and it, and all this. So, uh, and I'm not disparaging those, but I, I just, you know, do what you have to do to make this work and, uh, and, and keep putting this information out there. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, I, I, I appreciate, um, you saying that and I, and I definitely appreciate like coming on this podcast and, um, the opportunity to have a good conversation about this. And I, gosh, I, there's so much more that I want to talk about. Like, I, I want to talk about confirmation bias. I want to talk about who to select as your go-to expert because people are not careful enough about that. You got to be careful about whose opinion you're going to trust. This is your health. You know, this is your most valuable commodity. Don't give it up to just whoever's going to tell you what you want to hear. Look for the right person. That's, that, I guess I would close by saying that. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Bolsowitz, a.k.a. Dr. B. We don't have a book to promote this week, but that is not going to stop me from plugging the Smart People Podcast Amazon link. And you can reach that at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. Just a reminder, use that link anytime you make purchases on Amazon. It comes to no extra cost to you, and it greatly helps support the show. If you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review over there. Chris mentioned a handful of studies in the intro of this episode, and just as a reminder, you can find those studies in the show notes. All right, moving on from the interview to our normal housekeeping things, You can head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com to check out all the old episodes and sign up for the newsletter. And as always, if you'd ever like to reach out to Chris and I on the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. That's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got a lot of great interviews coming up. So we will see you all next episode.